So to recap really quickly, last class where we ended up, we were starting our discussion about surface tension or the thermodynamics of small systems. So remember, all of the calculations that we're effectively doing in this class are assuming an infinitely sized system, right? But this is infinitely sized with respect to the size of a molecule. So a glass of water could very easily be considered an infinitely sized system. Right? It's many, many times larger than a molecule. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we have an interface between two different fluids, now this could be the same fluid but just two different phases. So this could be the vapor water, liquid water interface. This could be an oil water interface. Any interface between two different phases, even a solid liquid interface. There is an energy penalty by having two dissimilar compounds in contact with one another. And this is because right, they're, they're sort of, uh, their attraction repulsion doesn't exactly match up when we think about it in terms of molecules themselves. So if we are trying to push in and get one of the fluids to enter into the second, you can see that as you have a curved interface, right, that requires more energy to accomplish that task. All right, and this concept is known as surface tension. I prefer thinking of this as surface energy, and the units work out exactly the same. So I kind of pre-wrote out some of our material here, because uh, if we can get through the theoretical content, I have a brief uh, demonstration, because surface tension is one of the fun systems that we can actually kind of visualize and see. Chemical engineering oftentimes is referred to as what they call a virtual engineering, meaning that a lot of the calculations and tasks that we perform are really difficult to replicate. It's not like mechanical engineering or electrical or computer science, whereas computer science, you can make a demonstration out of anything because you're just sitting in front of a computer. With chemical engineering, it's really difficult for me to have a continuously operating flowing distillation column to say, hey, look, here's how the distillation column operates. Right, so it's hard to do demonstrations. Surface tension is one of those fun few ones where I can actually do a demonstration. I also have a diffraction one later on in the class when we start talking about um, atomic theory. Okay, <clears throat> so the energy balance on a droplet, right, this is a closed system, and we're assuming that there's no shaft work that's being conducted, which makes sense because it's a teeny little droplet. So the total rate of change of the droplet with respect to time is going to be equal to how much heat I pull in or pull out of the droplet, the expansion of the droplet, and this is typically what we've seen before, the PV work of the droplet expanding and pushing back on the surroundings. And then lastly, we've added in this new term right here that we've neglected previously, which is the effect of surface tension. So if we look at surface tension, or again, I always like to think of it in terms of surface energy, this is the energy per unit area to form that interface. Energy is a force over a distance, right? A newton meter is a joule. Area is obviously just distance squared. So if we cancel things out, the SI units for surface tension are newton per meter. But anyway, it works out exactly the same as if it was a joule per meter squared. That's the same exact dimensionality in terms of the units themselves if you break them into the base units. So what we're going to do <coughs> is we're going to play around and manipulate this equation and see if we can get these two terms to collapse into one. It's not too difficult to do so. The volume of a droplet or a sphere, now the reason why droplets are spherical in shape right, is because that minimizes the surface area to volume ratio. So that'll produce the lowest penalty of surface energy. Any other shape will have more surface area for the same volume. So here's just our, our formulas for the volume and the surface area of a sphere. So if we take the differential of these with respect to the radius, we get 4 pi r squared, 8 pi r. Rearrange the expressions, solve them for dv and dA. Substitute them into our energy balance. Say minus P times my four squared. 
So all I did was substitute differential changes in volume with respect to differential changes in the radius. We can now pull out like terms. And then there's a similarity here between this 4 pi r squared and this dr, which brings us back into the volume units again. So our final energy balance in a more compact form will be equal to where I've written this as pressure internal, where I P internal is equal to the pressure plus this additional contribution due to the surface tension. Okay. So just a little bit of arithmetic and calculus to get to this point right here. So, what this tells us is that the pressure inside of a small droplet of fluid is always going to be higher than what we call the external or kind of the macroscopic sized pressure. And we have this additional contribution here due to the surface tension. Meaning that if we have a droplet surrounded by another fluid of a different material, the pressure inside has to not only exceed the external pressure, right, like we would expect if we're just blowing up a balloon inside of you know, well, the atmospheric pressure, right, we're pushing back the atmosphere. But in addition, as I try and grow, I am creating additional interface and I'm pushing back the bulk fluid, which requires work. Meaning that I need to exceed by a significant fraction potentially whatever it normally is to push back. In other words, the fluid B can squeeze in fluid A with effectively a higher force because it can, it's easier to keep it contained. So the pressure inside of a small droplet is higher than the pressure that it would normally experience if it were a macroscopically sized system. So to give you an example, and further also, right, if we take a look at this and we have a radius of infinity, then this contribution basically goes away. Right, the bigger the system it is, the less of a contribution it's going to be. So for water, just to give you an order of magnitude estimate, for water at standard temperature pressure, you know, 25 degrees C, one atmosphere, the external pressure is approximately equal to the contribution from the surface tension, or in other words, the internal pressure is twice the standard pressure. Another way to think about this. This occurs when the droplet is about having a radius of approximately 10 to 20 nanometers, which is a pretty small droplet. Right? Emulsified water can be accomplished you know, on the order of hundreds of nanometers with really strong surfactants in the right solvent conditions. So surface tension effects become significant. Anything that you're talking about micron-ish or anything significantly smaller than micron-ish is obviously going to be a larger contribution. But it also depends, of course, on what the surface tension is that we're dealing with. If there's a high surface tension between two different fluids, like an oil-water interface, it's going to vary at what point this becomes significant. But the consequences, in order to look at this, uh, for the most part, we're talking about phase transitions. So we want to see what the consequence of the small system droplet is on phase transitions. So to accomplish that, we're going to calculate the fugacity of a small liquid droplet relative to the fugacity of a bulk fluid. I have a question. Yes. What happened to the 4 pi r squared? Good question. The 4 pi r squared uh, is, 
So oh, dv is 4 pi r squared, so we just combined these two into the dv. Okay, so we want to look at the fugacity of a small liquid droplet. So the fugacity, as we have described it, is a function of temperature and pressure. So what we're going to do is take the relationships that we've already described for liquid fugacity, but instead of using pressure, we're going to take just a general liquid fugacity, no droplet, but instead look at the internal pressure. So we've just substituted the internal pressure. <coughs> so the fugacity of a liquid is a function of temperature and pressure is the fugacity of the saturated fluid, right to a first approximation if your ideal, if your gas phase is an ideal gas. That means to a first approximation, your vapor pressure is a good estimate of your fugacity. And then we included this additional correction term called the pointing correction. This allows us to understand what the fugacity of the fluid is at a pressure significantly higher or further away from the vapor pressure. Now, normally, this isn't a significant contribution until you get to you know, thousands of PSI or you know, tens of atmospheres or something like that. And of course, you can always estimate whether or not you need to include this by just comparing the magnitude of the vapor pressure or the fugacity of the saturated fluid to how much this throws it off. Right, so it's easy, it's straightforward to calculate whether or not you need to bother with it. So what we're going to do is instead of going from the vapor pressure to the system pressure, we're going to go to the internal pressure. So we can break this up into two different steps. So taking advantage of exponent properties, we can now simplify this going from uh, P vapor pressure to the system pressure times by the exponent going from the system pressure to this additional contribution here, which is the internal pressure. Let's see if I get this right, P, P internal. Okay. So recall, right, exponent properties, if I add things together in an exponent, it's the same thing as timesing the exponents together. So all I'm doing is breaking up this integral into two different steps. One going from the vapor pressure to the system pressure, one going from the system pressure to the internal pressure. This would be the acid droplet. So the one above the last equation, so that's P internal then? Yes, P internal. Yes. Well, which one here? This second equation in the middle. This one here, this is just the general definition for the fugacity of a liquid that's subcooled. So what we've done is then we've just substituted, we've taken it going from the vapor pressure to the external pressure. We could clarify this and call this the external pressure. That's the sort of the bulk macroscopic pressure that would be exerted on fluid B, for example. And then the internal pressure would be the fluid that B is kind of exerting onto A, which is the combination of the, you know, the, the, the physical compression and also as a result of the surface tension effects. So what this is saying here, this expression, this first contribution, this is just the fugacity of a subcooled liquid based on the bulk temperature and pressure characteristics. So in this case, what we can see then is that the fugacity of a small droplet, well, rather any droplet, I mean, we don't, we'll know if it's small, whether or not this is significant, right? It's just going to be the fugacity of the liquid plus an additional pointing correction, which has exactly the same functional form as the original pointing correction here.
Sorry, it's a little bit crooked there. So we're going to do a couple of simplifications here just so we can uh, explore a little bit what the consequences of this are. We did a similar approach when we talked about the fugacity of just a bulk liquid. If we assume that the volume is approximately constant over these pressure changes, which for a liquid is probably a pretty reasonable assumption, right? we can just integrate this simple expression here. So in that case, the fugacity of a liquid droplet divided by the fugacity of that bulk liquid itself simply going to be equal to, da, 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 da. let's see, let me drop a term here. Oh yes, I did screw up. Sorry, I did drop a term. We have a 1 over RT included in here. Sorry about that. Hopefully you can squeeze it in there a little bit in your notes. <clears throat> okay. So then we can write this as the specific volume of the liquid divided by RT. And then when we integrate just dP, it just becomes P2 minus P1. So in this case, it's going to be the internal pressure minus the external pressure. The difference between the internal and external pressure is just this term right here. Right? This two, 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius. <clears throat> so the conclusion here from all this little work Okay, here is the whiz bang of the whole problem. This term, volume, always positive. Two, obviously always positive. Surface tension or surface energy, always positive. RT, always positive, and radius, always positive. This expression here is always going to be a positive number, meaning that the fugacity of a small droplet is always going to be higher than the fugacity of a bulk fluid with the same temperature pressure characteristics. Now the important consequences of this, one, that means that the vapor pressure The vapor pressure of a droplet is always going to be higher than the vapor pressure of the bulk fluid. So this becomes very important when you're talking about combustion processes or running an engine. So if you can take gasoline in your car and you can spray it into as small of droplets as humanly possible, not only right, does the gasoline want to evaporate into the gas phase because of the hot you know, engine gases, but the smaller the droplet that you can make it, the easier it is to run away from that fluid and it's going to burn more quickly. And it's going to burn more evenly. Right? So that's one consequence. The next consequence is that the Gibbs free energy of a droplet is always going to be the Gibbs, larger than the Gibbs free energy of a bulk fluid. Now this goes back to, I'm going to, let's see, where should I? Chew up some things. I'll go over and just raise this. Right, this goes back to when we were talking about subcooling and superheating. 
So when we had our vapor liquid uh, equilibrium drawn using a cubic equation of state, and we look at a plot of pressure versus volume, when we have potentially vapor liquid equilibrium, the cubic equation of state will look something along these sorts here. At some pressure, these two areas are going to be equal. That's going to be the vapor pressure at whatever the system temperature is that we drew this isotherm at. Right, question six of the homework. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into applications and we talk about liquid-liquid equilibrium. But if we were to repeat this at a series of different temperatures, eventually we'll hit the critical point where we lose an inflection point. And we can draw two regions on this chart. The dashed line here is what we call the spinodal. This is the outlined region where the fluid is unstable, right? Due to the second law and the curvature of entropy, this is not allowed, right? You can only have fluids that have an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So in this region, right, you have a positive slope of a plot of dp, dv. That's not allowed by the second law of thermodynamics. The second region over here, that is the binodal or the phase coexistence curve. This is ultimately what we're trying to solve for. The spinodal does have some, some interesting information in terms of how fluids phase transition. And again, it comes up most commonly in liquid-liquid separations or polymer solutions. So this region, let me change colors. This region in between the binodal and spinodal is where a fluid effectively wants to phase transition, but it may not necessarily have the energy to do so. As soon as you change the fluid conditions where it hits the spinodal, it'll basically snap it instantaneously, or as quickly as diffusion can occur, instantaneously change. So, what this consequence here is telling us is that if I try and create a droplet at some bulk pressure, when that droplet first forms, it's significantly smaller, meaning it's going to have a higher Gibbs free energy. Right? Spontaneous processes occur when you go to lower states of Gibbs free energy, meaning that if I'm trying to boil my liquid, I have to first form a bubble of that vapor inside of a sea of the liquid itself. That takes energy to do so. That's what allows me to go into this region here and be a superheated liquid. Likewise, it allows me as a vapor to go into this region here and be subcooled. Same thing happens with solid liquid transitions, right, where it doesn't freeze until it finds a nucleation site. So the reasoning behind this is the physical act of forming a bubble takes energy, which means that unless there's a nucleation site, which sort of eases that surface transition. So for example, it is easier to form an interface if there's a surface, right? Because you're cutting away potentially a lot of the dangerous surface tension here. And again, this is the same reason why when you're in chemistry class, Presumably, your glassware should be very, very clean with no nucleation sites because that's going to affect your chemistry. So if you don't put in boiling chips into your flask when you're doing your chemistry work, you're going to have a superheated system. So when you mix in your chemicals, it's going to violently boil over. Again, like I said, I wouldn't know what that's like because I was not a particularly good chemist. Right, but that is the whole point of boiling chips is to avoid this issue, meaning that if a bubble can form on an interface, it's easier to do so if the surface tension or surface energy between your fluid and the surface is lower than between those two interfaces. Right? It kind of eases the transition. So that's why this talk here on surface tension is kind of fun, because it gives us a lot of intuition about why things happen the way that they do. Any questions? Because you've got a short demonstration, but I think we'll have to, I don't think we'll be able to record it. Um, we'll have to gather around somewhere, and hopefully I can get the demonstration done.